Hello, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Risk Management in Environmental Health and Safety Management Systems, Defining and Building a Risk Management Strategy for Environmental Health and Safety Management Systems, sponsored by ETQ. My name is Kyle Morrison. I'm the Senior Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The views of the speaker and his organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Mention of any commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorse them. At the end of today's webcast, we'll have a question and answer, sh and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, then click the Submit Question button. Feel free to ask your question at any point during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, but due to the large number of participants today, not all the questions may be answered. However, any unanswered question will be forwarded on to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, please click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation survey, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after the presentation. This webcast will be archived for three months, so you can access it after today's live presentation. Within about a day, just simply return to the same URL to access the webcast. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to begin. Our speaker today is Tim Lozier. Tim is the Product Safety Manager for ETQ, where he fosters the development of leading quality management software solutions. Tim? Hi, how are you doing, Kyle? Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, today what I'd like to talk about is uh, how we're going, how we measure compliance in, in the complexity of business today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the risk management process and how it's driving new ways of looking at compliance. Uh, we're going to look at understanding the relationship between risk management and risk assessment. Uh, also looking to see how all this fits into an environmental health and safety operational context. And what we'll do is we'll take a look at a couple of key risk tools and some case studies on how risk is being used in these EHS processes. But I want to get, first off give you a brief overview on ETQ as a company. Um, ETQ is uh, one of the leading EHS uh, quality and compliance management solutions that's designed for identifying, mitigating, preventing high-risk events through automation, integration, and collaboration. We were founded in 1992 uh, based off the concept of streaming business processes. Uh, we had a strong background in EHS and QMS. Our founders really focused on uh, improving compliance. So out of this came the technology. The, the, the goal was to leverage technology to support the business and not really build technology for technology's sake. And that's really how ETQ's workflow platform was born. It's called the Flexible Workflow Engine, and it really automates business processes and provides a robust configurable platform and it lets uh, companies adapt the software to meet unique business needs without having any extensive programming. Uh, the core markets really serve the EHS uh, compliance management initiatives. So uh, as I stated before, it's configurable and uses very intelligent workflows that automate business processes, and it also builds in industry best practices. Uh, it's very flexible, web-based, and easy to use. And the enterprise nature of the solution really allows businesses to scale and integrate, as well as report on. So whether you're a startup company or Fortune 100, it's really it's benefit uh, for tools to meet your needs. And, and one of the reasons that ETQ is uh, at the forefront of risk management is because the software is built into that. And, and so one of the things that we want to do is, is address operational risk in businesses. So with all that out of the way, let's, let's actually talk a little bit more about risk on a, on a higher level here. So when we look at the dynamic of business uh, from any industry, really, there's, there's really an increasing rate of change. Whether you have changes in products, uh, processes, or even regulations, they're all driving up against each other. And one process may have an impact on the next. And increasing oversight on compliance regulations and standards, we're starting to see complexity as a growing theme. So whether you're talking about safety, health, or environment, or general compliance, complexity is, is on the rise. So what we see is that organizations are becoming more complex. Businesses are increasing their global footprint, and there's a worldwide scope of locations around the world. And you couple that with the addition of mergers and acquisitions, and you really start to see a disparate trends in safety and compliance. So as we get more complex, our safety cultures may change. So from a cultural or regional perspective, but also from a company cultural perspective. And as you continue to grow and expand, you, you see increased changes in environmental regulations and requirements. Companies are really needing to address that impact on both safety and environmental as they grow and become more complex. And what happens is, is there's a disconnect on how we organize the safety compliance once we expand in complexity. 
And as we enter a more complex world, the level of regulation shifts. So whether you're solely domestic or international, you're really faced with regulations at local level, national level, sometimes across multiple uh, national levels. Um, they vary. They vary by country. They vary by region. And these regulations are ever-changing. They're ever-shifting in, in being designed to meet these complex requirements. Really, from, from a safety side, as you increase in the complexity in production and the offerings, job safety considerations also need to evolve. You need to ensure that safety is met as you continue to roll out new processes and new products, and these employees need to be adequately trained in order to keep training and safety considerations in line with the new complexities. So all these factors are weighing in on organizations, and on top of all this, you've got to maintain compliance with the new pace of business. So how are we able to keep up? Well, we can keep up through technology. Uh, it's just, it certainly helps to ease the transition. So automation of critical compliance is, is really a start. Um, we're implementing technology in businesses to streamline and connect business processes that are in line with our compliance initiatives. And we're driving better process automation now. We're integrating our business systems. We're tying more areas of the business to each other and really trying to better communicate and create vet, greater visibility into these operations. And we're trying to harmonize our processes. We're trying to keep a consistent singular workflow or singular process that adhere to these compliance initiatives. And this all comes at a cost, of course. So systems are an investment. And they're also investing time and resources to maintain compliance. So you're faced with this cost of compliance reporting. Whether you're spending time and effort into sustainability reporting, compliance reporting, or whatever, you need to invest in the tools to, to demonstrate your compliance. And as safety regulation change, you may be faced with the cost to comply with safety. So, for example, you may need to change equipment to adhere to a safety regulation. You may even you need to adjust entire work area just for a safety regulation. These are all costs that are associated with compliance. But we know that compliance is necessary, and, and it can be a significant investment. And so how can we ensure compliance but find ways to streamline the compliance process while mitigating any costs? Well, risk is becoming a way many organizations have sought to streamline their compliance in a very objective and systematic way. So what I want to illustrate today is that risk management really needs to be a holistic approach. When we think of risk, most often people immediately shift to risk assessment. And however, what you'll see in this presentation, presentation is that risk management is really, uh, you can't really have risk assessment without risk management, just as you can't implement a risk management program without having a risk assessment component. They're one and the same. They, they rely on each other. And the core message is that in order to make compliance streamlined and efficient in an EHS context, you need to have a level of risk management methods in place. So a good way kind of to benchmark where we are in this compliance uh, dynamic is to look at standards. Now, this is really no end-all, be-all of compliance. Um, you know, standards vary, they change. But for illustration purposes, it makes a, a good point. And the point is, is that in these standards, whether they're ISO or others, risk as a concept is catch, catching on. So if you look at ISO 14001 or OHSAS 18000, uh, these standards have an element of risk built in. Uh, certainly, you look at the ISO 31000 standard here, which is really built for risk management. And we'll get more into this, but uh, the key is, is that as we move into the new area of, era of complexity, um, we couple it with a strong focus on compliance, the standards are actually responding to this risk management story. And we'll begin to see that over time, more and more risk is becoming a focal point in, in these compliance initiatives. So what I'd like to do is just take a, a quick look at the ISO 31 standard for risk management. It's, a, it's really a, a broad standard, and it's not really one you'd use necessarily to adhere to business operations, but it's really used as a general interpretation of how risk management process is defined. It's a good starting point, and, and it's really a great way to get started on a risk journey for, for anybody who's looking to understand risk management. So risk management actually starts with the identification of any relevant risks. We want to look at our operations, and we want to figure out where the hazards are. We want to survey the different operational areas, and we want to look for where those, the risks of those hazards might be. So it's not really done in a vacuum. You want to assemble a team uh, to help identify these risks throughout the operations. Most companies will go in, they'll assemble a team together, and they'll go through and uh, look at all the operational areas and figure out where the hazards and the risks are. The next thing you do is you take your, your known risks, and, and you really want to do two things. You want to determine a way to quantify those risks. So you want to look for ways to measure the risk in a very systematic and objective way. Most people will use scales, such as severity or probability. And the next thing you want to do is actually implement a process for evaluating and assessing the risk. 
This is really where that risk assessment piece plays its part in the overall risk management process. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how you assess risk in a little while. Um, the key point, though, is, is with risk, it's the ability to come to a decision as a result of your assessment. So you use the tools to help quantify and filter the risk, but ultimately you need to make a decision on how to handle the risk. There's many factors out there, and uh, you can see here we have different ways. So you can accept it. You can say it's worth the risk. Uh, you can reduce it. You can take steps to mitigate it. You can use compensa compensation. So find ways to insure yourself against the risk. You can even transfer risk. Some people will source risk out, uh, go to a partner or supplier with a better management process. Or if the risk is just simply too much, you may avoid. So just stop the process altogether. But once you made a decision, then you need to implement that, that decision. So that, that arises either as a management of changes to your processes or operations, implementing controls to mitigate or reduce the risk, or any improvement activities that you can ultimately support your decision. And so really, that is a closed loop. So what happens is the changes you make implement new processes or new ways of doing processes, and then you reevaluate again. So risk management is a circular process. And that's really what, what the process is at a high level. However, before we get too deep into all this, let's just take a quick step back and let's take a look at some of the terminology behind the risk. So I like to use this little cartoon as kind of a basic example of how you look at risk management and the terminologies. So you see in here we have our, uh, in this case we have our hazard, which is, which is an anvil hanging over the head there. Um, and really a hazard is, um, is any situation that poses significant threat to life, health, property, or the environment. It's really an undesired event. The risk in this case is, is any potential that a chosen action or activity will lead to the undesired event. So in this case, it's that tripwire that would trigger the anvil. And then finally, you want to put in controls in place to really evaluate the potential losses and take any actions to reduce or eliminate the potential for that undesired event to actually occur. So in this case, we put a bridge over the tripwire, so we prevent ourselves from tripping over the wire and, and dropping the anvil on our head, which we hope none of your work areas look like this. Um, hazards, risks, and controls, these are really the core concepts of, of risk management. So when we talk about risk management, we're not really just talking about one area of the business. We're not really talking about EHS, where risk is really pervasive throughout all the areas of organization. So it really does span everything from EHS to quality to financial to supply chain. Risk management is really kind of like an umbrella. It spans the enterprise, and that's really why it's so powerful you can use risk as kind of a universal methodology for benchmarking compliance. So while you have uh, safety nomenclature, you have environmental nomenclature, you have ways of talking about EHS events, if you can put it into a risk context, you can actually translate that across the entire enterprise. And that's what really makes it a, a very powerful methodology. So what we said earlier was that when people think about risk management, they, they tend to really think about risk assessment tools, and that's where most people go. And the tools are really important, uh, but they're really one piece of the whole, and it's really the content behind them that's the most critical aspect. So what, what I'm trying to say is having a tool in place is good, but it's not going to capture everything. We use these tools like risk assessment to identify the known hazards, but how do we know what our unknown or unidentified hazards are? Tools are not going to really help you find the unknowns. You need to have a risk management process really to find the unknowns, the things that you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, similarly, how can you adjust your risk levels and associate guidance as your business evolves? The tool is really a fixed point when you, when you look at it that assesses the risk and helps you make a decision. But you need to look at the content and context of your operations and adjust risk levels over time and make changes to the guidance as you encounter new hazards and new potential risks. And, and you need to realize that the tools are really just tools, and you need to understand the limitations of those tools. We also need to understand that people are not inherently good at assessing risk. We're not really adept at a lot of different things. We're not adept at expecting things we can't perceive. So we can't really um, expect the unexpected. We can't anticipate unexpected events. Uh, when we do encounter hazard events, our ability to record them is actually flawed. We're not recording machines. Humans are not recording machines. We take events and we attempt to reconstruct them as we see them. And perception is not always good as what the actuality is. Uh, another concept is we tend to see patterns in random events. People always look for order where we can't find one, and then we become subjective. 
Um, another thing is that we, we tend to think we have a deep knowledge of all these processes when we may only have a basic understanding. We also insert our own understanding into a process and then it becomes subjective conclusions. And then finally, we, we tend to group think. So what really happens is, is if we all follow a similar consensus to issue and we all have a common uh, opinion, then that must be the right decision. And, and the, really the point to all this is that without a true structure and process, the, the using tools alone can really lead to subjective errors in risk recording. And so we need to also understand that prediction is hard. Even the experts don't always get it right. Um, you know, financial analysts are not always right. The weatherman, he's not always right all the time. So we need to make sure that we understand the limitations and limit ourselves on how much we predict versus how much is presented to us as hard evidence. Um, there's also a paradigm that we either have too little data in our system or too many minor risks. So what I mean is that if we're not collecting a lot of different items and risk events and adverse events, then we really do not have an accurate large sample set to draw from. So we need to continue to collect data, collect lots of data into the system to really build the sample set of, of events to really round out the risk story. Conversely, you may have a lot of little events with minor impacts, and these will fly under the radar because they're minor. But if all these minor events all happen at the same time, then you have a critical impact. So, for example, if you have a, a factory, right? A factory could be uh, at max production, which is most likely tolerable. Uh, in another case, you also have a routine fire safety maintenance going on, which is very normal. You could also have, um, you, you could also be starting a new production line, not uncommon. And the uh, weather is, let's say, predicting a snowstorm this month. I hope not this month, but it may happen, knowing what the weather's been like lately. So all these things on their own represent a minimal risk level on, its, on their own. But if all those things happened on the same exact day, the risk of a safety event may increase significantly. And so we need to be attuned to that kind of way of thinking when it comes to risk management. So the structured approach is in risk management, not in necessarily risk assessment. And you can't really have one without the other, though, right? So risk is management needs risk assessment and vice versa. But the key here is that the risk management is the process which we systematically come to the right conclusions, and we use risk assessment within the overall process. And we need to use the process to help eliminate that subjectivity and maximize the effectiveness of the tools within the process. And the last thing I want to cover on this slide is that you need to collect a lot of data. I mentioned it before, but I want to mention it again because it's, it's very important. So one operational area is not often enough. Single points are not going to give you, they're going to give you something, but they're not going to give you the whole picture. So you want to roll out risk management throughout the enterprise, recall all types of data, not just the more critical ones, look for near-miss data as well as critical data, and it really rounds out your risk management picture. So as stated before, risk management is the process which we should be applying to our content, and it helps us to ensure that risk is properly used. However, the risk assessment piece in itself is really a core technology, and these are the tools that you need to use to measure. Uh, risk assessment provides you with a means to evaluate risk in an operational context. It really gives you a, a way to apply the event data in a risk-based approach. And what makes risk assessment tools powerful is that they're repeatable and they're objective, so you can replace otherwise subjective gut feel with a more guided decision-making approach. It's also easy to understand for people who aren't directly initiated into that process. In many cases, it's, it's even color-coded, so it's, it's very easy to understand. Uh, risk assessment tools will help you drive change, so both in long-term and short-term context. And what you're doing is building alerts for critical events and wrapping guidelines and decisions around uh, risk assessment to develop a solution for risk uh, levels that aren't acceptable. Uh, these solutions become systematic. They're repeatable. So you can implement solutions for high risk in a more automatic, consistent manner. Um, it provides that objective reasoning. Uh, however, it's important to understand and reiterate that it's a tool. It's not a solution. So like any tool, you need to be careful falling into what we call a false sense of security and relying on the tool alone. Uh, in some cases, you know, you may have somebody who's on the shop floor. He sees something as critical risk, and he escalates it. And when he rolls it up to the top floor, the risk may not be as bad in that larger context. Um, risk needs to be universal in that sense, so it's not really can't be a matter of opinion. You need to continuously test risk assessment methods with content and data, and actually tweak your risk tools within that data. You want to have a team in place. Most companies will put a risk team in place that will actually vet the risk tools and make sure that you're achieving the right results. Even when you go in to make decisions on risk, it shouldn't happen in a vacuum. You should have a risk team in place to help make decisions as a group. Uh, 
Um, so as your operations change and more data fills the system, you find that risk levels might need to be adjusted, just like any business tool, really. So what I'd like to do is get into really where this all fits into environmental health and safety context. Uh, risk is found throughout lots of different operations, and this is just one you know, quick overview of where you might see it um, and kind of just putting out there where it kind of makes sense as a viable tool. Uh, so to start in process design, as you're designing processes within your EHS, you can build risk in an operational context around something like job safety, building risk into each level of job steps and rolling up risk to determine what the overall risk of that job truly is. And we'll get more into that. We have a few case studies to kind of illustrate that. Um, as you impact management of change in your organization, risk is a powerful tool. It determines the impact of change from a risk standpoint. So if you're building any, any inherent hazards with any process design, you could do a hazard analysis. Uh, it's a good way to look at your process, determine where the hazards can be encountered throughout the process, and build risk to systematically measure and mitigate the risk. And your level of training is going to be impacted by level risk. Higher risk processes may require additional or more stringent training. All these, all these things need to be taken into account when you're building out processes from a risk-based perspective. Now, also, during normal EHS operations, incidents, accidents, adverse events will happen. And when you encounter these adverse events, risk assessment can serve as a decision-making agent to help you filter severity and criticality of those events and to help you make better, more informed decisions. And just like incidents and accidents, many organizations have built-in behavior-based observation processes, which foster continuous monitoring from within the organization of at-risk behaviors. A risk assessment can help you also determine uh, the level of risk at, of at-risk behaviors and help you prioritize and measure these levels and severities of all these things. Um, any organization is looking to foster continuous improvement as well. It really drives your business to be more efficient, operate in a more streamlined, compliant manner, so when we talk about building risk into continuous improvement initiatives, we can see sustainability reporting as having an element of risk, where what areas of the sustainability of the organization pose the highest risk and how can we mitigate it. Um, similarly, you could look at internal audits that will also measure the effectiveness of your EHS system. And if you build risk into the auditing process, you can help prioritize the level and nature of your audit reports. Uh, also, corrective and preventive actions are a great way to assess risk. How are you... Uh, how can we not only effectively correct systemic issues, but also correct them within acceptable risk levels? So risk assessment serves as an important check on the effectiveness of our uh, corrective actions. You know, did we reduce the level of risk? Uh, if not, maybe we really need to go back. Maybe it's not truly effective if it's not within risk parameters. So these are just a, a couple of the areas that uh, we see risk assessment being measured within EHS operations. And what I'd like to do is, is kind of get into the, actually the tools that are most commonly used and a couple case studies on um, uh, how they're being used in businesses today. So this is just only a sample of, of some common tools that have been used in EHS organizations. There's literally dozens of risk tools out there beyond these. Uh, you look at FMEA, HACCP, Fault Tree, there's many others. Um, we're just going to take a look at a few here uh, and see how they've been effectively used within the EHS context. So we're going to look at uh, risk matrices, uh, decision trees, bow tie, and then we're going to look at something called a risk register. So the, the most common, perhaps the most common in many industries, is, is, the, uh, is the risk matrix. The risk matrix is really a grid that's quick, it's easy, it's colorful. It's designed to make the risk level evident to all people within the operation. And what risk matrices do is, is plot two, sometimes three levels on a graph. And it's usually severity, probability, probability or likelihood. Um, each risk level is assigned a number or, or context within the graph that you plot a formula, and you calculate the two numbers where they two, the two numbers intersect. It's usually multiplication. So you assign the color to each level of risk, red, yellow, green, and you have this nice heat map, very simple format. Um, and some people use more colors, red, yellow, green. Some people use orange, depending on the complexity of their uh, risk uh, scales. The goal here is that you're defining a risk level based on two levels, and you're building guidance into the results. Uh, and it helps you to make a better decision based on the calculation. But you have to be careful with this one because you've got to vet the risk matrix because sometimes you'll get results that are mathematically sound, but they don't really fit into the context of your operations. So to mitigate this, you really need to vet that matrix using real-world examples. So you build out your risk matrix, and you look at historical data, and you plug the risk matrix into that historical data, and you look to see if your results are actually getting the right result that you, you actually did back in the day. So some tweaking may be required, and once you've vetted that graph, 
the risk matrix really is one of the most powerful risk assessment tools for making a decision. So here's how a couple organizations have used uh, risk matrix within in their, in their business. And the names have been removed here, but the cases are actually real. Um, the first one here is a, uh, a major power utility that has uh, international presence. They're serving seven different countries. They actually implemented a, a job safety analysis program to ensure that their employee jobs were indeed safe. Um, they decided to take it a step further here, and they built in a risk assessment into their JSAs. So every job position uh, is analyzed by step, and it's periodically reviewed. And like any JSA, they're looking at every single step and determining what PPEs and controls to put in place to ensure these are safe. But for each job step, what they're doing is they're actually putting a risk assessment um, using a risk matrix. So in this context, the risk matrix is serving as a quantitative measure on the job step, and it's providing guidance on the level of a risk for the step. So for each step, the risk result will provide this uh, guidance on what possible decisions need to be made to reduce the risk. Uh, and then they use formulas to roll up the risk to, to derive a risk ranking for the entire JSA, the entire job. And what the risk matrix is doing is it's providing them with an objective, repeatable method for mitigating the risk, and it helps them to determine whether PPEs are needed, process changes are needed, even training required to bring any of that residual risk down to an acceptable level. And when you think about it, with employees across seven countries, um, having that risk matrix in place has really become a universal measure for them for building an effective and consistent uh, JSA program. Uh, the next company is a global facilities management company. They have about a uh, thousand plus locations worldwide. So it's very complex, very um, many, many organizations all over. Um, and, and in this complex organization, there's varying levels of training for each location. So each location is going to have their own safety professional, and there tends to be a variance on the level of training. No matter how much you try, a thousand locations, there's going to be a variance on the level of training. So in order to uh, compensate for this uneven training, they're actually using a risk assessment matrix as a guidance tool. And as you stated before, as we stated before, uh, building in guidance to the risk matrix can really help professionals come to a decision more effectively. And so in this case, they built a tremendous amount of guidance so that any professional, regardless of what variance in their training they had, can come to the right decision. So as an incident report is submitted, uh, the risk assessment tool is going to provide them with literally over 30 options divided into five categories. Uh, it's, I think it's environmental, regulatory, injury, service quality, and equipment. Uh, this level of detail provides them with a way of coming to a decision that overcomes any subjective barriers and follows that corporate standard for safety report. So from this, uh, risk, excuse me, from this risk matrix, they're able to drive safety alerts and take immediate action on incidents. And they also have a common and universal means to build out those trends and reports across those thousands of facilities. The next method that I wanted to cover is, uh, is one that many people probably use without even knowing it's really a risk assessment, and that's the decision tree. Uh, decision trees really are a risk assessment. And if you think about it, you're given an input, an adverse event, and you would use a decision tree to help determine the outcome of that event. You really, uh, you're, they can be built in such a way that you can come to the right decision and provide guidance on the decision. And it's really an effective way of risk assessment, especially since it follows the user through a path, usually through question and answer trees. So if this, then this. If yes, then this. If no, then that. Um, they're really powerful in the way that they can be embedded directly into your operational processes. Um, they don't have a diagram mathematical, mathematical context like the risk matrix. So you can build them directly into the system as part of that process. So it's really good when you're assessing the impact of a process change uh, in a change management context or determining when you need to report something to a regulatory agency, or even if you're just determining if an adverse event needs to be opened up as a corrective action. So let's take a look at uh, how uh, another global utilities company has been using uh, decision trees. So in this case, this, this utilities company um, is also spanning an entire region, really, across a couple countries here. And they have a complexity in their organization. So they have a very complex organizational structure, multiple levels, and they need to have a well-defined means of how uh, to notify members of their safety team on incidents. And depending on the risk of the incident, different individuals are going to need to, need to be notified. The higher the risk, the further up the chain it needs to go. So as they conduct an incident investigation, they built in decision trees, and the decision trees determine the immediate risk level and the severity of that incident, 
And based on these levels, they can automatically generate the proper distribution lists and who gets the notifications. And really, the, the decision tree is building the risk level and the notification at the same time. And so for the highest risk levels, it escalates the notification to deeper levels. So it could be just a general notification. It could actually go down to text messages. So that's what they ended up doing. For the highest risk level, it's not only sending emails and, and notifications, it's sending text messages. And, and really, the idea is that the more critical the incident, the more visibility it's going to have to those who are responsible. This way they can better respond to incidents, take more immediate, uh, more immediate action on critical issues, and really get in front of any unacceptable trends and make improvements for the long term. And it's all accomplished through a decision tree within their incident investigation. Okay, so you may ask yourself, we don't have a lot of critical events, so we really don't have a history of risk. Um, bow tie is a great method for assessing risk on low occurrence events. Uh, in some cases, you may have very little data, uh, potential critical events, but the undesired effect of those events are so catastrophic that you can't afford to sit and wait for that to happen. Um, this comes into play in a lot of airlines. It comes into play in a lot of chemicals, chemical companies, even companies that are facing recalls to, on, on undesired events. So unlike the previous tools, bow tie is considered more of a proactive risk assessment tool. Uh, what it does is it looks to mitigate risk before it even happens. Uh, the model itself really looks at the undesired effect, so it's really something bad like you know, a, a major incident, catastrophic incident, and then it builds out the controls as barriers to prevent that event from, uh, from occurring. So here, here's how it works. You have an undesired event in the center, and you analyze the impact of the event. And you're effectively building out a scenario in which the event might occur, and then you're putting preventive controls in place to mitigate the risk of it actually happening. Similarly, you also want to build out recovery controls to minimize the impact if, God forbid, the event does happen. So what I like to do with this one is, uh, is kind of look at driving as an example. It's kind of a nice layperson way to kind of explain bow tie. Um, so when you, when you look at and uh, most everybody drives, so when you look at an undesired event in driving is maybe loss of control of the vehicle, right? And, call, and it, so you lose control of the, uh, the vehicle and you, you cause an accident. So in this scenario, you, you would take this undesired event, which is the lost control accident, and then you figure out what the potential threats might be uh, the cause of that. So common threats could be rain, rain falling down maybe, uh, poor visibility, uh, maybe you're driving too fast, maybe you're a tired driver, or you have bad tires. So how can you put controls in place to block those threats? So you can control them with windshield wipers, put some windshield wipers in place, put headlights, uh, implement a speed limit, uh, go get yourself a cup of coffee or tea, or put better tires in. So these are preventive controls that would reduce the risk of that event occurring. But also in our example, so, so we have all those controls in place, but what if the event breaks through all those control barriers and still happens? We need to implement recovery controls to prevent the consequences from being too dire. So in this case, the ultimate consequence may be death, may be accident, um, may be injury. So you want to put recovery controls in place to mitigate the risk of, of death or injury. So what are those? Uh, you may put seat belts in place, airbags. Uh, you may put guardrails onto, uh, onto the highway or crash barrels. They're not going to prevent the undesired event from occurring because we've already at this point lost control of our vehicle and we're going to have an accident. But we're mitigating the risks of the consequences. Even though it still occurred, you put barriers in place to make sure that the risk is minimized as much as possible. And so that's really bow tie. Companies use this method to really guard themselves from events that they don't have enough historical data to actually build out tools for, but they need to make sure that they're protected from a both a preventive standpoint and a recovery standpoint. Uh, like I said, this is commonly used in oil, gas, chemical, aviation industries. And I actually have a case here I want to illustrate in the aviation example. So airlines are predominantly safe in terms of major safety events. And so those undesired events are few and far between. Uh, but they need to safeguard themselves against those events as much as possible. So you have this one uh, commercial airliner. Uh, they monitor safety reports that are submitted from any one of the 60,000 plus employees and subcontractors throughout the world. Um, in order to operate an efficient safety management system, these safety analysts have built a massive bow tie model. Uh, it consists of thousands of threats and thousands of controls with only nine possible consequences. 
These are the obvious ones that have catastrophic impact on their safety program, runway incursions, loss of altitude, near misses, crashes. The fact that they have a 1,000 of threat control barriers to guard themselves against only nine consequences shows you how much data they're analyzing to prevent that undesired event from occurring. So in order to truly be effective in their bow tie model, they're actually automating the calculation of the data that comes in and the risk levels for each of these threats. And they're using years and years and years of historical data and estimating based on the historical data what the severity and that likelihood of those events are, or those threats are really. And based on the calculations, they're able to immediately drive alerts, take immediate action on potential threats, and respond quickly so that the barriers and these controls that they put in the bow tie are able to protect them from these infrequent undesired events and their potential consequences. So uh, risk management, risk assessment are really designed as a means for measuring uh, and making decisions to affect compliance. But as we stated before, content is really king in risk management. As you measure and take actions, you're building out a history of risk within your organization. And there's valuable data that, that can help you fine-tune operations based on the history of risk. Uh, the risk register is designed to do this. Um, what the risk register actually is is literally a library of hazards. And it takes uh, risk data from all events, whether job safety analysis, incidents, accidents, any adverse event, and it centralizes it. So it's a, a central location that gives you the visibility into risk within all operations. Um, really what it allows you to do is, is build risk trending. And, there, and risk trending is a critical component of risk management. It needs to come from that historical data. So you're building a history of risk from various operational areas, and you're reporting on the trends for, for that area. Now, not all operational areas are going to be the same in terms of how you assess the risk, but what the risk register is really doing is providing a common location for the data uh, from your operations and, and whatnot to, to look at how risk ma management has evolved over time. and allows you to analyze and trend on where the high risks are, where you need more oversight, and uh, how can you, you can improve operations and, and using risk as a benchmark for overall compliance. So the risk register is really that centralized location that lets you take a look at the data at an aggregate level and actually build in reporting, build in trending, uh, foster change uh, based on risk levels across multiple areas of the industry. So if we were to map out how EHS and, and compliance system are, are put together might look similar like this. You, you have uh, source data that feeds into the investigation and the corrective action, and then you have outputs that affect change, uh, documentation, reporting, and all similar areas like that. So as we move into this risk-based world, you can almost place the risk register right at the, and risk management at the center in the middle of all this, because risk is pervasive across all these different processes. So they feed into how you measure and, and you react and compliance and how you analyze effects of these events and foster change as a result. Uh, risk is really becoming the new center uh, of the EHS system in this context. So risk management, uh, if, it, if it hasn't already started in an organization, it, it starts now. Uh, you know, uh, what this really means is that the compliance is moving towards uh, risk management focus and, um, and building in risk technologies and tools is a really great way to, to benchmark and measure your compliance. Uh, however, risk technology is not automatic. They're just tools. They're tools to support decision making. They don't replace people. Uh, risk tools take out, take, will take a level of subjectivity out of the equation by virtual historical data and quantitative risk tools, but really the ultimate decision relies on people. Many organizations, as I said, will assemble a risk team to ensure that decisions are made properly and they will use historical data to help fine-tune their risk picture and, and really ensure accurate results. Uh, so, so I guess the question is why risk, right? Well, risk is common for all levels of compliance. And as we said with the umbrella slide, it's, it's a universal language that's applicable to many operational areas. And it's really because it is that objective, systematic way of filtering and prioritizing events. And, and in this complexity in the fast-paced world we live in, we need to really uh, improve the speed and quality of our decision-making capabilities. And risk terminology offers a, a common understanding of complex operational issues, and it really can be easily interpreted at all levels of the organization. So really, if your op organization and your EHS operation can speak risk, you can really drastically improve your ability to uh, make an impact on compliance within your business. And so with that, Kyle, I, um, I'll turn it over to you. We can start fielding some questions.
Great. Thank you, Tim. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, before we dive into the Q&A, I just want to remind everyone of the short evaluation uh, that I mentioned at the top of the presentation uh, that we're asking you to complete. Uh, the survey should be appearing on your screen. Uh, we just ask, consider completing it to share, us, uh, to share with us your thoughts. Uh, your input helps drive future webcasts, so I hope you take the time to fill out the survey. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, please, please turn off your pop-up blocker. Um, okay, now let's get to some questions. Um, can we discuss risk methods, uh, or can we use risk methods discussed today for other operational areas beyond EHS, such as uh, quality time? Uh, sure, yeah. And so, as I said before, you know, risk risk methods because they're universal, you can uh, you can really apply them to multiple different operational areas. Um, certainly, quality is is the next logical leap. They share a lot of common processes. Um, managing documentation, managing corrective actions, managing adverse events. Um, these methodologies are very pervasive across multiple areas. And what a lot of companies will do is they will look at risk methods and uh, try and find commonality and build out tools uh, to, to go across all operational areas. So really that's, that's been the key, and, and a lot of companies will actually build in uh, chief risk officers and risk teams and, and risk and, and compliance uh, departments that actually will look at this type of context and how you can uh, expand risk to the enterprise. Okay, great. Now, now you talked a little bit about a, a holistic approach, um, but what is the best way to address high-risk events? Um, should it be by department or by a certain operational area or as a group or a team, or is it kind of all of that? It's uh, it's actually it's a little of all of that, really. I mean, again, what most companies will do is when they when they get into a uh, risk management process and in, in the context of risk management, they'll look at uh, all areas. They'll look at they'll start at their operational area, um, and they'll look at the different uh, hazards that are in there and potential risks. They'll drill down by department. Um, they'll look as a team into uh, into different groups and teams and and. The more granular they become, the the more they may uncover. And so the, the key is really to to build out a taxonomy of of different risk types, and uh, and try and group everything into into that risk context. So that way, you're looking at those areas. Now, addressing high risk events becomes a part of assessing where where your potential risk areas are. So when you look at um, when you start building out your risk management program, you'll have a taxonomy. You'll have different areas where all the risks are. And then as you encounter adverse events, uh, when you start looking at these tools that you build out, you'll be able to uh, figure out decisions on how to address the high-risk events. Well, how does a, a company go about getting started in building a risk management program in the first place? Um, good question. <laughs> a lot of companies will, will, will spend a lot of time and, uh, and money uh, with consultant firms to, to really go into the the uh, the risk management process and um, you know the 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 real the real thing is just to to start looking at your processes and looking at your operations. A lot of companies will actually do surveys across the, the organization to figure out where all those areas are. And, and as stated in the earlier question, it was um, you know it, it's it's critical to make sure that you're um, gathering all the right areas and you're not you don't want to um, you don't want to get into two – there's two things you don't want to do. You don't want to oversimplify your risk management program, but you don't want to make it overly complex as well. So you want to try and find that, that uh, commonality um, that doesn't allow you to um, have it maybe too broad where you're not covering enough um, versus, uh, you know, making it overly complex where you're, you're – you know, covering too much and you just have too much to, to handle. So, so really what the uh, – the best way to start is to, to look at the, the operations, look at where your, your risks are and look at, look at – understand your processes and build out a, a program where you can identify hazards and then start building them into uh, a, a context where you can look and say, okay, what were the tools that we need to really uh, understand these uh, – the risk areas within these processes? 
Now, some of the uh, some of the examples you gave for ver for some of the various risk management approaches you know, talked about these large global firms. Is risk is is a risk management approach something that can be accomplished by a smaller organization, or do you need to have a lot of capital and be a huge company in order to to take advantage of this? No, and that, that's that's a good question. It's a, it's a good point to make is that you don't need to be a Fortune 100 company, or you don't need to have multiple. Um, you know, facilities across the globe to necessarily be qualified to have a risk management program. Risk management is really a, a practice that is, is beneficial to any operation. Um, and it doesn't have to be something that uh, I think a lot of people start when they look at risk management and they look at all these different terminologies and, and whatnot and, and all the different methods that are in there, they, they tend to say, well, geez, I mean, that's not that's not for us. I mean, we, we, it's too much for us. And, and the reality is, is that you can actually build in very simple risk management concepts. So a lot of times companies and, and operations will be doing risk management without even knowing it. And that's one of the things we see a lot is that, you know, they'll be making decisions as a team and they'll be using a quantitative context that's maybe unbeknownst to them is, is, is using elements of risk. So really, you, you, it's always a good practice to follow the idea of identifying where your potential hazards are and figuring out how what, what kind of decisions you need to make and, and figuring out ways to make them systematically and, and in an objective way. So really, there's no, there's no uh, qualifications in terms of size and, and complexity to, to necessarily go after a risk management program. I think the idea is, is that as uh, the businesses are becoming, the whole industry is you know, tends to get more complex as you introduce more, um, you know, global context and more uh, more supply chain information, and it tends to get more complex. But if you're a simple operation, you still can benefit from, from a risk management process. Okay, great. Now, now, going off that a little bit, you mentioned complex. Um, what about uh, – using risk management in a complex or diverse company, one of the questions we have from one of the uh, participants today is, you know, ask if there is a danger of oversimplifying data collection and analysis and, and, and swallowing up the small risk areas by the large group areas. Sure. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's kind of the other side of the coin, isn't it? It's, you know, you could, you could, uh, you don't want to oversimplify, but you don't also want to make it overly complex and you don't want to get too, uh, washed up in a lot of different areas, but what the the idea is to to really um, is really about process, making sure you understand where where you're collecting your data and and how you're collecting your data, and then taking the tools and uh, and properly filtering them, and and that's why risk teams are in because you know again you you don't want to oversimplify uh, the data collection process, you don't want to oversimplify the analysis, and most companies will put a team in place and a process in place to, to manage any sort of adverse event and any risk that's in there. Um, similarly, if you, if you are diverse and you, know, you have small risk areas and large groups, you want to make sure that um, you know, these operational areas are, are taken into context, so you'd want to uh, Build out tools in place and build out processes that really leverage the the uh, teams and people who are who are really invested in the safety of, of the EHS program or even just in the general compliance. You want to make sure that the um, tools are supporting the uh, different areas and events that are coming into play. What about the question of getting employees to understand and, and recognize risk? I mean, how do you What's the best way to, to encourage that? Uh, it, it's actually interesting because, again, to, to that point, a lot of people don't realize and they don't understand uh, risk in, in terms of um, some of these concepts we've talked today, but in most cases, a lot of them are, are, are doing risk today, and they don't, they, don't, they don't think about it because they're doing it in, in terms of their general operations. So what, what I always recommend is, is to really educate people on what they're doing today and how risk is, is built into that. And not, not try and change their, their you know, methodologies in terms of how they, how they approach. You don't want to say, okay, well, now you're going to be doing risk management because chances are they probably already have done it in some, some sort of context. But what you want to do is you want to enroll them in the concepts of, of what decision making is all about and why you make decisions in a systematic way and why why it's important to to be objective and why these tools really are um, are designed to, to take out any sort of guesswork in the in the uh, 
in the decision making process. So I always say to, you know, when you enroll employees into this, you try and take what they're doing today and you try and relate to them on um, you know, if they're doing stuff today that that fits into the risk model, how can you um, educate them on on how what they're doing today and and what they what the changes are, how that relates to to the risk context, and it, it tends to help uh, ease that transition for people who don't necessarily understand or recognize risk today, but um, maybe are doing it or or have uh, been enrolled to do it. Okay, great. How does how does risk management interface with root cause analysis? Um, Interestingly enough, um, and I didn't get I didn't get too deep into it in terms of um, the whole corrective action process, but um, risk management can be used in a couple levels. And when you look at risk management, um, you know you can build risk into a lot of different processes. And that's that was kind of some of the areas that I was I was looking at and saying, yeah, this is just one small sample set. But reality is, is you know if you're building adverse events, you want to be able to filter them before you even get to the corrective action process because not everything needs to be a corrective action. So you may have you may have uh, very critical events that are coming in um, that have high risk, and you may have uh, events that are coming in that have low risk. And what you want to be able to do is filter in, filter out what's critical versus not what's not critical and prioritize based on risk. That, that's the first step. Uh, most people tend not to do that. Most people tend to take uh, uh, any event and, and they put it into a corrective action and uh, when they do recall analysis, they say, well, this, this is not critical and, and, and they, they look at only by what's most overdue or what's due tomorrow versus what's the highest risk. And that becomes a, a, a difficult situation because you may have a high risk event that came in, and if you're not filtering it and you're not prioritizing by risk, you may miss it. You may you may get to it later than you probably would have liked to. So that's one aspect when you look at um, when you're building out an investigation on a, on a corrective action and doing a root cause analysis. You want to build in risk to to figure out how to prioritize this. How, I mean, is this something that we need to get to? You know, we need to jump on right away, or is it something that um, you know we can? There's other stuff that's more critical. And then, you know, in the, the other side of the, the corrective action process is, is in that effectiveness check. So you've done your root cause analysis, you've filtered it by risk, and you go into your effectiveness check and you're saying, okay, was it effective? Well, you know, it, it did what we said it was going to do. Is it effective, though? And doing a risk assessment to say, is it effective within risk levels is another dimension to add to that. So there's a lot of stuff you can do in, in terms of root cause analysis, corrective action, verification, where risk can actually fit in pretty nicely as a filtering agent, a prioritization agent, um, and also as a check, effectiveness check. Okay. Now, now, risk controls are obviously you know, fairly critical to the risk management process, you know, in ensuring that they're implemented and, and enforced properly. So how, how do you go about evaluating that system and, and making and, and supervising to make sure that, that those controls are uh, implemented properly and are, and are being in, in enforced? Uh, you know, I always say that the, the, you know, one of the, one of the big barriers is, is to do some internal auditing is to really go in and audit the system, make sure that people are enrolled, uh, proper training, um, you know, um, you want to make sure that when you build out your processes, you're building out the, the controls in, in such a way that they're following in line with the standard, but also you're able to, to regularly look at those and evaluate. Um, the risk register actually provides a, a pretty good method of uh, collecting that historical data and actually seeing where you are with what, you, what controls you've put in place um, and, and how you're actually... Uh, measuring yourself and, and whether you're doing it right, whether you're doing it to the, to the standards that you that you want it to be done to. So, the whole concept of having a centralized resource where where all that stuff filters into and being able to take a, an aggregate look at it and then drill down and, and either audit it or and, and go through a, a review and, and look at how things are uh, how things are shaping up from your risk management program. That's typically the best way to to make sure that things are being enforced. Now you you mentioned that there are there are several ways to assess risk. You know, there's the there's the matrix, there's the decision tree, and the bow tie. Um, could you maybe go into a couple of others that may be out there for for uh, some of our participants that that they may choose to use, or, or why one method may be better than another? 
Yeah, I mean, those were just some samples from, from one area. Um, like I said, there's other ones out there. Um, another one, and this is predominantly used in more product manufacturing design, is, is the FMEA, Failure Mode Effects Analysis. So that's uh, basically a kind of a what-if uh, hazard analysis that looks at design, looks at, um, from a production standpoint, um, how can we look at what we have today and, and figure out in the design phase what the top risks are and make changes at the design level so that way when we build out the production and we go into uh, into a, the, the live market, we have uh, mitigated as much risk as possible in the outset. And then as we go through and we change processes, products, uh, mostly for products, the FMEA helps in that sense. Um, you also have something called HACCP. I think uh, if you're in the food and beverage industry, most companies know about HACCP, which is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. Um, that's also a form of risk assessment. Um, you can build risk into it. It's also inherently uh, designed to look at hazards from a process standpoint. You're looking at different steps within the production process. You're looking at the potential hazards, and you're actually doing an assessment on the severity of those hazards. Some you put in controls in place. Um, so it's it's a lot like what you would do in sort of like a GSA type situation where you have a step, and you assess the hazard of that step, and then you put in a control in place. Um, there's other ones out there. There's fault tree analysis, which is a little similar to um, to decision tree. Um, that's used in a lot of energy areas as well. Um, so there's a whole host of them. Um, that, that you can really generate uh, a lot of risk uh, methods from. So, but the, the real key is that whatever you use, whatever whatever is out there, really, it's really what works for your company. And I think that's the key: is that there's no one tool that is uh, is pigeonholed for for a particular industry or a particular type of organization. Um, you look at those tools and you say, okay, what's What's going to make sense for my organization? Is it a risk matrix? Um, I know medical device companies that have implemented HACCP. Um, I've seen you know decision trees across multiple different types of companies. So really, it's it's not so much as what's pigeonholed in my area. What's it's really what works for your business. Okay. Now um, I don't know if you're familiar with Six Sigma, but could risk assessment or, or risk management be integrated into a Six Sigma si system? Um, I'm not as familiar with Six Sigma, but um, from what I know, um, there's, there is some, uh, there is some areas where you could probably put it into, um, you know, again, anything that's a process. So, I mean, I'll say this and I'll kind of answer this in, in a general context. Whenever you have a process in place, any sort of process, whether it's, um, you know, DMAIC, Plan, Do, Check, Act, um, Six Sigma, uh, lean manufacturing, any, any of these processes that are built into uh, your operations. Um, whenever there's a uh, an event, a, a place where you want to benchmark compliance, uh, you want to do a check, you want to um, you want to actually uh, put in a, a control point um, and make a decision, and you need to make a decision. Risk, risk is a great place to benchmark compliance in any of those contexts, any process. And so that's kind of what I say with that is that you know. If you have a process and there's a particular gate that you want to implement a, uh, a place where you have to make a decision or you have to really, um, you know, put a barrier in place to, to figure out what uh, what the next move is, uh, risk is a great great place to put that in. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I apologize uh, to everyone whose questions we didn't get to, but uh, just uh, a reminder that all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speaker. Uh, once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback so we can improve and, and make future web presentations even better than today's. Um, and with that, that concludes Safety and Health Magazine's webcast. I'd like to thank Tim, ETQ, and everyone who listened in. Thank you all, and have a great day.